told you about the Bernoulli's principle last time. Bernoulli's principle, not in your book. The Bernoulli effect, not in your book, but still an important thing that I could ask you about on the test. All right, so make sure that you're, you're getting that from the note. Uh, the Bernoulli effect says that if I have a high-velocity fluid, uh, a liquid or gas, then it's going to be low pressure. Actually, no, I'm sorry, not, not a fluid. If I have a high-velocity gas, only a gas, then I have a lower pressure. So, for example, here in an airplane wing, which is you know, the typical application of this, I, I construct my plane wing so it's longer on the top side than on the bottom side. And so this is a higher velocity because you imagine I have two particles here. When they separate, because we don't want to have a vacuum, they come back to the same point at the same time. So this side has to travel faster to get across the top of the wing, giving you high velocity and low pressure. So high pressure, low pressure, it pushes up, you get lift. Now we can see that elsewhere. I brought a couple of things to show you. Um, like this is just a ping pong ball in a cup, right? Or it's actually a votive candle holder. But if I put a high velocity stream of air across the top of it, it's going to create what kind of pressure? Low. A, a, low, a low pressure. But inside the cup, I have a high pressure. So that high pressure will, will lift up the ping pong ball. You want to see? Oh, you see? I'm just barely blowing, but I'm putting a low, I mean a high velocity stream of air, and then that causes a low pressure. So I have my cup, a ping pong ball, I put a high velocity, so low pressure, and then that causes the thing to lift up because I have a high pressure inside of the cup. Do a similar thing. You might have seen this before. Kind of cool. Hair dryer. My hair dryer. It takes forever to dry my hair. It's like half an hour sitting there. Um, so if I create a high velocity stream of air. <laughs> That's all the Bernoulli effect. And the Bernoulli effect is very important in the way that we produce sound because we have two vocal cords that are fairly close together. And then we push air through those two vocal cords. And when we push high velocity air through the vocal cords, what's going to happen to them? They vibrate. Uh, they vibrate, but that, that's sort of secondary. What happens if I push high velocity air through an open space? What's it going to create? A high or a low pressure? Low pressure. It's going to create a low pressure. So what's going to happen to those two vocal cords? Okay. They're going to pull together. Right, and you can do that with a sheet of paper. Plus some extras. So you can imagine these are your vocal cords. You know, you might think that if I blow air through these, it's just going to blow them apart, right? That's sort of the intuitive thing. But really, it's going to create a low pressure inside of the uh, inside of the the space, the glottis. Remember that glottis is the space between the vocal cords. Yeah. <laughs> No, go ahead. Okay, so does that work similar to a magnet because light forces are No, magnets are, are entirely different. We'll talk about magnets later. Right. Uh, so in the glottis, that's the space in between the vocal cords, if I put a high velocity air, I push with my diaphragm, causes a, a decrease in the volume of the lungs and an increase in the pressure that forces that air through the, the windpipe or the trachea up to the larynx where your vocal cords are. If I produce that high velocity air between the vocal cords and the glottis, it causes them to come together. What? You see them come together? The sheet, two sheets of paper. You see that? Isn't that cool? Well, you wouldn't think that to happen. I would think that the, they would just fly apart because you have this wind going in between the sheets of paper. But actually, it pushes them together.
Oh, because eventually the the weight of the ping pong ball exceeds the the force of the pressure. Okay. And so it just falls down. All right. So um, muscles will bring the cords together. And initially, air flowing pushes the cords apart. So they're just stuck together, and then you push air through them, and it just sort of forces its way through. However, a low pressure, due to the Bernoulli effect, causes them to come back together again. Just like the two sheets of paper, it'll cause those vocal cords to come back together. Um, and then this low pressure oscillates. Because, you know, as we're learning to speak, we're learning to create different pressures with our diaphragm that can change our voice. We don't think of it that way because we're babies, right? But as we're learning to speak, that's what we're learning to do, is to produce different sounds with our vocal cords, which is affected by the pressure of the air, the speed of the air that we're pushing through the vocal cords. You can what? I don't know. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah, children are much more, or can learn different languages much easier. <laughs> All right, I don't doubt that, but that's different from what we're talking about. So the sound produced by the vocal cords is also changed in a complex way. And it's not just like a guitar that our sound is changed by the, uh, the mouth, the throat, the nose. You can be a really nasally speaker or you can... You know, speak from the mouth or the throat. It changes a lot. The sound of your voice is affected by those other things. You can change those sort of in the way that you speak, but mostly it's set by just who you are. All right, let's look at the anatomy and physiology. I think this is a real long section. But we'll look at the ear and how we hear uh, various hearing problems. Then we'll also look at how we measure the intensity of sound and some safety things and then ultrasound imaging. Um, so at a basic level, our ears just detect vibration. They're like a microphone. Remember with a, a microphone, we talked about this, how we have this diaphragm that's connected in some way to an electrical signal, and then you have waves that come along and they cause that diaphragm to vibrate back and forth. And the ear does a similar thing. It's the diaphragm, the eardrum right here, that, that moves back and forth when a pressure wave, a longitudinal wave, impinges upon that, that uh, eardrum. The ear has three parts. You need to know the basic parts of the ear. The external or the outer ear. The, um, that sort of, you know, the oracle, the part that you see on the outside. The middle ear. This is sometimes called the tympanic cavity. That's sort of down here where we have the, uh, the eardrum, or the, what's it called, the tympanic membrane, I think. Uh, timpani, like the big drums, those are called timpanies, so you can think of it in that way. Um, and then the internal or the inner ear. So those are the three big parts of uh, the ear. We have some other words for these. The big floppy part on the outside of your head, that's also called the oracle. Not with an O, but an A-U, oracle. Uh, this the, the 
the canal that runs from the outer part of your ear down to where the uh, the eardrum is. That's called the auditory canal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are just the basic parts of the ear. Um, we'll get into this, but these things right here are called the ossicles. Uh, this, I'm in red. This, this, and this. You don't need to know the. Uh, do you need to know the names of those bones? Y'all probably know them anyway, right? The malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Yeah. So anyway, you need to know the generic name for them are for all three. Those are called the ossicles. Sometimes they're called the auditory ossicles. Those are bones in the ear. They're the smallest bones in the human body. Did you know that? They act as a type of lever. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, this is the eustachian tube. Oops. We'll talk about that in more detail, but uh, ear at tubes, put in your ears. I have a kid that has tubes, put in their ears. The reason for that is, is that the eustachian tube uh, allows for drainage from the ear. But sometimes in little kids, because they're little, and uh, sometimes because the eustachian tube isn't downward like that, but it's more horizontal, it can clog easily and, and get infected inside their ears. Is that the tube that connects to the sinuses? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so like if you gargle with salt water or whatever, that salt water can get up inside of your ears, or if you go swimming, it can get up inside of your ears. I was, I was forced it up by mistaking up water into my ear through there. Yeah, it'll drain. It'll drain if you have good eustachian tubes. But all that's connected to your sinuses and your ears and all that just water up my nose. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what, yeah, and I had the bright idea of closing one of the nostrils to add more pressure. Okay. Do you have bad sinuses? Uh, if you have bad sinuses, then I think, I'm not sure, I think, I don't know, I think it's worse. Right, yeah. That's why when you get a cold, you get your sinuses. Mm -hmm. Right, because you get fluid inside your ears. The outer ear includes the auricle and the auditory canal. The oracle is that visible part, the floppy part of your ear. Some of us have floppier ears than others, right? Anyway, it's the visible part. Um, it directs sound waves of a particular frequency to the ear. Or to the auditory canal. So that's why you have this funky shape on the outside of your, your ear because it we our ears pick up a certain range of frequencies at 20 to 20,000 hertz but even within that there's a more specific frequency that we need to hear even better so it picks up that set of frequencies and and funnels them in a way into our ear. So people with different shapes of ears can hear different Sort of, yeah. It, it affects the way that you that you hear different sounds, the shape of your ear. And then the ear canal, it's about one inch long. So what if someone who doesn't have that? Uh, they can still hear, but it's just not as efficient. Yeah. So it's about one inch long. Uh, it's open to the auricle and closed at the eardrum. And it acts to amplify. You know, I say amplify the sound. Uh, you shouldn't put anything in your auditory canal. Right? Q-tips, not supposed to use them. I know that we like to use Q-tips because, I don't know, it makes us feel good or something. But you sort of get addicted to use them, right? It's okay. You know, it's personal. But you're not supposed to put anything smaller than your elbow into your auditory canal. That's just sort of the general rule. 
that whatever you have in there is coming out. It's going to come out. And if you need, if you have something to pack this day, you should put it off here. Alright? Don't put stuff in your ear. It's very bad. <laughs> uh, the middle ear, so the outer ear includes the auricle and up to the, the membrane. And then the middle ear includes uh, the eardrum and the three bones called the auditory ossicles. That's that malleus, incus, and stapes. And here's a maybe a, a blown up picture of that. This is the tympanic membrane. Like I said, like a tympany, like a big tympany, those big drums that they have in the symphonies. Uh, and then it is attached to the these three bones, the auditory ossicles. When the tympanic membrane vibrates, it pushes on those bones. The way they're set up, it's it has a lever so that I get a small force here and then I get a bigger force here. We talked about that, right, in our forks chapter. If I have a small force put in, I get a bigger force here. And that's why the those bones look the way that they do. Uh, the middle ear also has the opening to the pharynx. It's called the eustachian tube. And this is to equalize pressure with the atmosphere. See, ever gone on a plane or go up into the mountains or even I know when we go up over one of our river bridges my ears will pop and that's the reason because you have uh, high pressure inside of your middle ear and you have lower pressure outside because you've gone up in elevation and it causes your your ears to pop it causes that pressure to equalize through your eustachian tube. Sarah? So actually for myself I don't know about anybody else but what if I get on a plane my ears to pop, so they'll stay like that. Yeah, because your eustachian tubes aren't really big enough. And so you can you can cause them to pop. You can do that, right? That'll sort of massage your eustachian tube. Everything actually dumb, I like. Yeah, I don't know. Live with it, I guess. Or not fly. Yeah, not very good tubes. All right. Uh, this can get blocked with um, mucus, inflammation, it's all connected there. And as I said, children are particularly susceptible. One, they're just sick a lot because, you know, their immune systems aren't familiar with all of the little illnesses that we have. And then also they're just smaller. So their eustachian tubes are smaller. And in some kids I understand that their eustachian tubes, while they should be like this, they're really like this and they just don't drain very well. But that changes as so they get older. So they'll put bigger tubes in there? They'll put in an extra tube oh, okay. uh, to drain out this area right here. I don't, know, I don't know where they put it in, but they might put it into the eustachian tube along the way. Or maybe they put it up inside of the eustachian tube. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. All right. So the eardrum is also called the tympanic membrane. It uh, it vibrates when sound impinges upon it. Alrighty. Looks like I do want you to know the three bone names. But it's like a song, Malleus, Incus, Stapes. I don't know. I guess you can make it into a into a, into a, uh, a song. So the auditory ossicles are the three bones, three small bones. Uh, the Malleus. I like to think of this as a hammer. Like a mallet, yes, connected to the eardrum. It's not really a hammer, but it sounds like hammer because it's a malleus. Uh, the incus looks like an anvil. No, you're thinking of the cochlea. 
We'll get to that. That's what it looks like a snail. Um, and then the stapes looks like a stirrup. That's the cochlea. That's the one that looks like this. The stapes. Sort of like a stirrup. Or actually, I guess like that. Um, but really the important part is that the ossicles will transfer vibrations from the eardrum to the inner ear. And just like we talked about, that if I have a lever where if I apply a small force here, I get a big force here. Because they have a difference in their moment arms. This is a small force with a big moment arm. So I, I get a big force with a small moment arm. So I use levers to move big things, right? Because we can get a, put in a small force and get out a big force. And that's what your ossicles do. They take the tiny little force of the vibration on your eardrum and they convert it into a bigger force that then is converted into a, an electrical signal. We'll get to that. Uh, the pressure is multiplied by a factor of about 20. So the little bitty force that impinges upon your eardrum, that vibration, is made 20 times bigger when it's transferred to the next part in the inner ear and the cochlea. So the inner ear, you have three parts. Really, we're mainly concerned about the cochlea, but we'll look at the other parts too. Um, the cochlea is a fluid-filled chamber. Oops, fluid-filled chamber that receives uh, the pressure waves. For different pitch sounds. All right, remember pitch is related to which property of the wave. For a wave we had several properties. We had the period, we had the wavelength, we had the frequency, we had the amplitude. What is the pitch related to? The frequency, right. The volume is related to which of those? Amplitude. So pitch and amplitude are very important in describing sound. So the sound from a wave. Pitch is frequency, uh, amplitude is volume, or volume is amplitude. Yeah, frequency is related to our period. The frequency is the inverse of the period. You tried to trick us when you said you could do period. I was trying to trick you. That's my job. Try to trick you. No, I don't want to trick you. I just want you to understand. I want you to know about the body and the physics of the body. Okay, so the waves. The sound waves, those transverse or longitudinal waves coming to our body? Uh, longitudinal. longitudinal, or we also call them compressional, or we could call them pressure wave when we're talking about sound. Uh, the waves cause the basilar membrane <laughs> to vibrate in different ways depending on the sound. And then you have these fibers in the basilar membrane uh, that stimulate hair cells, not like hair on your head. It's a different type. I'll show you. These are particular cells that vibrate when they encounter a frequency of a certain value. I'll show you a video that describes this a little more in detail. They stimulate hair cells that are connected to the auditory nerve. And this is how we convert, this is where it becomes an electrical sig signal. So we take it from being a pressure wave into a, an actual vibration on the eardrum and then on the auditory, on the, uh, auditory ossicles. That's transferred to the cochlea, and the cochlea converts those vibrations into an electrical signal. So the big deal with the inner ear is primarily that it converts those vibrations to an electrical. Okay? You all clear with that? 
Yeah. So do you want us to know all this? Yeah, you need. Like um, I never asked the basilar membrane. So I, I don't expect. I've never asked about the os basilar membrane. But as far as the other things, yeah, all the other stuff. Oh, no, no, no. Although, uh, yeah, this shows the different parts. So the cochlea, I'm not sure how well y'all can see it. The cochlea is there, and you certainly need to know that. That's the thing that looks like a snail. Uh, and then the vestibule and the semicircular canals. Uh, where's the vestibule? This is the vestibule right here, and then these are semicircular canals. So yeah, you do need to know those three parts, the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals. Now the vestibule and the semicircular canals, these are primarily for balance. Uh, they have fluid in them, and when you move around, it causes that fluid to slosh inside of your ear, and uh, how that fluid moves around will tell you the rest of your body what you need to do in order to maintain balance. Okay, so that, that's a very important part of our body. Uh, I have a couple videos I want to show you here. You should try it. Go out in your yard or somewhere where you, where you have lots of space and you won't fall on anything. Like I would do it here, but I would fall on the ground and get hurt. Sir? So is this up down uh, dizziness and sometimes vertigo or down? I don't know. No, I don't think so. I don't know vertigo. Like but up down dizzy is when you you have to sort of bend over like this, and you have to bend at pretty much a 90 degree angle. And then you spin around. And when you do that, it causes the fluid in those semicircular canals to, to slosh around in a way that you're not used to. And that's why you just you lose control. You can't you can't not fall down, but you will fall. So try it out. Kids like to do it, but you know, kids like to do stupid stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. But it is kind of interesting. You should try it out when you go. Yeah. All right, let's try a few of these. Uh, you'll need to know the different parts of the ear, so this is a good figure for you to know. Um, which of these is called the definite membrane? And their number is it two, four, five, six, or seven. You should know the other parts too, one through seven. a few more seconds. Let's stop at say 43. Did we go over seven? Yeah, I'll tell you what it is in a second. All right, very good. B is the right answer. Four is the tympanic membrane. It's also called the eardrum, right? And then while we're on that, which fluid field chamber translates vibrations into an electrical signal? more seconds. Stop at 25. I guess if you're not sure. Uh, D is right. Is it 3 or 5? Okay, let's go through and we'll identify each of these because it's important for you to know all these different parts. Um, 4 is the eardrum. Seven is the auditory nerve. It's the nerve that goes to the brain. We mentioned it sort of in passing. This is the auditory canal. This is the auricle or the outer ear. Uh, these are the, the um, ossicles. 
This is the five is the eustachian tube. And six is the cochlea. So you need to know those in name, and then you also know, need to know what each of them does. Right, so that your drum vibrates, the obstacles are uh, increase the force of that vibration. The auditory canal leads from the oracle to the eardrum. It amplifies the wave. It acts as a sort of way to amplify the wave. The oracle is the outer part of the ear. It catches those frequencies and sort of funnels them into your, your auditory canal. Uh, what else? Auditory nerve goes to the brain. The cochlea transfers those vibrations into a electrical signal. Uh, these were not here, but you also need to know the semicircular canals. These help us achieve balance. And then also the vestibule is right here. It, it does similar. Okay? But know the, know the uh, semicircular canals. You got that? You got good? Yeah? That's my anatomy yeah, I'm sure that y'all did this in a lot more detail. Oh yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Especially when you talk about like the bones on the leg, you have to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. But a pony walked into a bar, and he said to the bartender, "Hey, give me a drink." And the bartender says, "What?" And the pony says, "Give me a drink." And the bartender says, "What?" And the pony says. Sorry, I'm just a little horse. <laughs> no, I did not. All right, I mean, so another bar joke, is that okay? A guy walks into a bar and uh, he has jumper cables around his neck. And the bartender, he asks the bartender, hey, can I come in? Can I get a drink? And the bartender says, you can come in, but you better not try to start anything. <laughs> I haven't heard that one have you? Okay. Can I tell you one time? This happened for a lot of joke. Actually, when I was working at the restaurant one day, at, we actually had a monk, a priest, and a rabbi walk in. Okay. Like, All real, together? All together, like same table, like sitting at the same table. You're like, that was a joke. Wait. <laughs> I so badly wanted to wait on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's do this. Describe what is the part labeled one in this figure. I need to know the other parts too, but I'll show you what those are. Just a few more seconds. Oh man, come on, y'all know this. Uh, one, this part up here is the uh, the larynx D. All right, so really, you just need to know the larynx. You need to know this part, this is the trachea, or the windpipe. Lungs are pretty important to speech. And then it's not listed here, but you certainly need to know it, that this is the what? The diaphragm. Those are the only parts that you need to know for the, the major parts of our system that produce speech. Uh, and then within the larynx, sorry. Within the larynx, the vocal cords. Oh yeah, the glottis is actually a space. So the glottis, if these are our vocal cords, the glottis is the space between the vocal cords. So I wouldn't ask you to identify something on a figure just because it's, it's hard to label. Okay? So I mean, technically, C could be right. Yeah, C could be right, but I was looking at that big, the whole big thing that contains the vocal cords. Yeah, I see what you mean. And the thyroid, I don't even know where the thyroid is up there somewhere. It's nearby, yeah. So, um, the first question that we answered. The tympanic membrane? Yeah. 
It's four, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, B. All right. What is the function of the ossicles? Stop at 25, 25. Good. C is right. The transfer vibrations from the eardrums to the cochlea. Well, let's practice on these others. What are these other things? Uh, to convert vibrations to an electrical signal, what is that? Starts with a C. Yeah, the cochlea. To resonate with particular frequencies of sound. That's hard. Which one is that? Yeah. Yes. Very good. The hair cells. And to vibrate the vocal cords. Uh, well, that's just the wind that goes through the vocal cords, the air, at, at slow or fast velocities. Remember, generating that low or high pressure that goes through depending upon the speed of the air that goes through. Um, let me get out of here. 850, is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, knock, knock. Interrupting pirate. Arr! <laughs> so we have to do our evaluations. Y'all probably done these before or in other classes. So we'll just do that in the last 15 minutes. And, uh, I had to do these yesterday. I was the little person. You want to be the little person? Oh, okay. okay, if you want to, that'd be great. Uh, I don't have to get started. The above diagram is T. What's that? I'm sorry, Kate. The above diagram is T. Is D6? Which one? Oh, right here? Six is the cochlea. Yeah. Right here? What are you talking about? Question. Uh -huh. The next one. Oh. Yeah, D6, yes. All right, guys, so look, the evaluation has two parts to it, and they're both important. First of all, does anybody need a pencil? A few extra. They're chemistry pencils. They're special. I need it. <laughs> there are two parts. So there's this part that you bubble in. Uh, this sort of goes through our channels, and I get a number, and I look at these numbers, and they're useful. I look at them year to year to sort of see how the class was or how y'all perceived the class to be. But they're useful. Other people see this, and they're, they're good for you to be careful on. Uh, the open comments, it goes into an envelope, and then it comes back to me. I'll get it at the, after the semester, after the grades go in. And this is important for me because often I'll go through these comments and make changes to the course. So things that you might want to think about. For example, um, the workbook. I just made the workbook not that long ago, so is that useful? I'm thinking about going to no exams, all quizzes, maybe like 10, 12 quizzes next semester. I'd love to know your opinion. Some of you have already, we did a clicker thing. But things that you might want to see changed about the course be useful for me to hear about. Okay? It won't impact you, but it'll impact your future students. Start ready to do it in detail. And then, uh, Vanessa, you know what to do. Mm -hmm. Take us to the dean's office, which is right over there. I'm going to be here for another minute, and then I'll get out of your way.